So in this lecture, we're going to talk about solving differential equations in Julia, specifically with the solver suite differential equations.jl. Uh, differential equations.jl is probably the most sophisticated differential equation solver suite in any language anywhere. Um, it has a lot of over 200 methods uh, implemented for solving all types of ordinary and partial differential equations, uh, st stochastic ordinary differential equations, DAEs, differential algebraic equations, delay differential equations, neural differential equations, um, all types. And so you can take a look at the documentation that I linked to here uh, to see more information about all the different types of solvers that are available. We're going to mainly focus on uh, ODEs and DAEs, the most common kind, and, and most of the examples will extend easily from, uh, from these demonstrations. So, uh, differential equations AL is not installed with the default uh, installation of Julia, so you do have to add it. It's a package. You can add it from the Julia REPL with the, the first line there uh, using pack PKG, PKG add differential equations, or from the REPL, you can enter the package manager with the square brace and then just type add differential equations to install it. So we're going to use these uh, equations, the Robertson equations, as examples. Uh, these are commonly used examples for demonstrating uh, ordinary differential equation solvers, specifically stiff ordinary differential equation solvers, because these are known to be stiff equations, and it takes uh, special treatment to solve these. Uh, just using the standard solvers in differential equations.jl, we can get a solution uh, because it has automatic stiffness switching and other things, but uh, we'll talk more about that when we see some of the solutions. So, uh, you know, the preferred thing we want uh, to do, we pr we'd like to do, is be able to write our equations in state variable form like this, where you have all the derivatives, the first derivatives on one side, and uh, all the states on the, you know, the functions or equations of state, uh, equations that are functions of states on the other side of the equal sign right there. I know this is not always possible to write your equations like this, but this is the preferred way you're going to get the most performance and use the best solvers uh, if you can write your equations in this way. So using these equations as a guide, we're going to implement a Julia function uh, that represents these equations. And again, for performance reasons, if we, if we can, it's often uh, best to use what are called in-place functions. And the idiomatic way to write in-place functions in Julia is to use an exclamation point uh, at the end of the function name. So that sort of uh, is a way to tell your users that, hey, look, this is an in-place function, meaning the, the first argument, the array du, is going to already be allocated. It's going to come into the function where it will be filled inside the function. So nothing is returned from this type of function, an in-place function. So again, uh, the arguments here, du, this represents the derivatives of the states, u are the states, p are additional parameters that go into the equations, and t is the time variable. So once we're inside the equation, we can unpack our states if we want, just to write our equations more cleanly. Um, so in this case, uh, we'll, we'll unpack our states into you know, the, the vector u into the states y1, y2, and y3, so that we can write our equations with notation that looks like the equations above. Likewise, the parameters uh, we specify here, k1, k2, and k3, this is just so that we can, we're not hard coding the coefficients for these equations, we can pass them in as arguments and change them to see how it changes the effect of the equations, or the solution of the equations. So uh, yeah, in this case, the, the parameters are just, you know, k1 is 0 0.04, uh, k2 is 3 times 10 to the 7th, and k3 is uh, 10 to the 4th. So once we do that, we just code up the equations basically as they look, filling in uh, the in-place array du, and we don't return anything from this function. With that function in hand, we can set up the problem. Uh, we have to use differential equations. Differential equations exports the function ODE problem. So this is how we set up a problem. We pass in the function we want to solve. Right? This is our system of equations along with initial conditions, a time span over which we want to solve over, and the additional parameters. So in this case, the initial conditions are just 1, 0, 0, and we're going to solve uh, for 10,000 times, or 1e to the fifth seconds. And uh, the parameters, as I mentioned earlier, uh, 0 0.04, 3e to the seventh, and 4e, uh, 1e to the fourth. So once we have the ODE problem, then all we have to do is pass that into the solve function, which again, differential equations.jl exports. 
So we pass that in and we solve and then we plot the solution. And you can see here the solution of this equation. Uh, you, you notice this little kind of oscillatory blip on the U2 solution. And this is due to the stiffness of the equations and the automatic stiffness switching that happened using the default solver. So in problems that I'll show in the future, uh, again, with this set of equations, I'm going to specify the solver. And you'll see that this goes away uh, by using a solver that's known to perform well for stiff equations and specifically for these uh, Robertson equations. So we can get a little more performance out of these uh, if we can specify the Jacobian and we can do that, you know, analytically, right? So the Jacobian of a function looks like this. In this case, you know, it's a three by three matrix for our three equations, just taking the derivative with respect to each equation, with respect to each state, and those become the entries of the matrix. Again, we're doing this in place, uh, passing in, so J will come in allocated, uh, along with the states, the parameters, and time variable. And, you know, we'll just fill in the matrix J like so and return nothing. So with that, we can then set up the problem. In this case, since we have both the function and its Jacobian defined, we set that up as an ODE function, and then we pass the ODE function into the ODE problem along with the initial conditions, the time span, and the parameters. And with that, then we can pass it into solve, and you see we get a solution. Now this time, I did pass in or specify the solver itself, the Rosenbach 2.3 method. And with that, uh, you know, that little blip that we saw in the U2 or uh, the Y2 state from the equations uh, goes away, right? So we get a nice solution here. Uh, if we benchmark the two methods, so we can import uh, benchmark tools, this B time macro, what this will do is actually run uh, this solve function multiple times and then compute an average over the amount of times. So because, you know, at any time you run a function, you're competing with system processes that are going on in the background. And so with every run, you could get a little variation in the time. And so this takes an average over many runs. And you can see that, you know, uh, when we specify the Jacobian, we do get in, in some increased performance there, even when we're using the same solver for both cases, because, uh, you know, it doesn't have to figure out what the Jacobian is. It, it, it's already... It's already allocated and, and knows what it is. You can also, uh, you know, in, in this case, the Jacobian's pretty easy to compute, but we often run into very complicated uh, equations where uh, the Jacobian might be kind of tedious to compute by hand. And for that, we can use automatic differentiation, which we've talked about in another lecture, and I'll refer you to that for the no notation um, for this Jacobian function here that I'm exporting from uh, forward diff. Uh, and, but in this case, again, uh, I'm going to use an in-place uh, function to define my Jacobian, so this J will be passed in, uh, as well as this Jacobian call from forward diff is in place, so it will be passed in and filled in place there. Um, you know, because our Robertson function is also defined in place where the, the first argument is, uh, you know, the DU terms, well, we have to define, and again, I'll, uh, you know, really refer you to the documentation of this uh, Jacobian function in forward diff to see the exact function signature. But the second argument is the function. And because we're using a function that has an in-place argument, we have to have a function of two variables. And the second of which uh, is the variable with respect to, we're going to take the derivative with respect to. So we're going to take the derivative of this Roberson function with respect to the second argument. <clears throat> and that is, uh, of course, the U term. So this is like D Rober DU. Uh, is what we're computing here automatically through automatic differentiation. And uh, with that, we can, um, you know, again, basically pass in the uh, Jacobian function here, uh, pass that into the ODE problem and solve it, and you see we get a solution. And if we benchmark all three methods, so the original method with no Jacobian, the hand-derived Jacobian, and the automatic differentiated Jacobian, you can see the performance here. So, of course, the hand-derived Jacobian gives us the best result, um, but there is overhead associated with this automatic, differenti uh, automatic differentiated Jacobian. So, it, you know, take a performance hit for doing that. But in some algorithms, it, it, you know, having a precise Jacobian, analytic Jacobian, uh, could mean the difference in the solve being stable or not. And so um, while we take a little speed hit here because of the overhead associated with that automatic differentiation, um, you know, it, it, it could prove valuable to do that nevertheless, to have a, a, an analytic type Jacobian or a, an exact type Jacobian. Um, 
We can squeak out a little bit more performance with using static arrays. So static arrays are you know like regular arrays, but they're they're um, they're meant to be for, for smallish arrays. So like arrays on the order of maybe a hundred entries. And so for for small systems, which I'll call less than twenty ODEs, and of course here we only have three, we can get some performance, a lot of performance gain by using the static arrays. So in this case, the only difference here, um, I'm I'm defining my uh, function of the ODEs, and this time I'm using not an in-place function, but actually a function that will return uh, the values of the states, or the derivatives of the states. And in, in this case, uh, this SA function is exported by static arrays, and it's a, it's a constructor to create a static array with these uh, variables, okay? And so then also I'm going to use that to compute, or use automatic differentiation to compute the Jacobian, and then uh, pass that in. Uh, so I have my function, my Jacobian function, and um, the final argument here is basically I'm telling uh, I'm, I'm telling it that I'm going to use a static array. So I want to allocate my Jacobian as a static array, uh, as well as I have to pass in my initial condition as a static array. And when I do that, then the static arrays will be used in the solve process. Um, I'm, I'm omitting the actual solve and plots here because it produces the same solution. You'll just have to trust me. But when you benchmark all four approaches, then again, the original, the hand-derived Jacobian, uh, the automatic differentiation Jacobian, and the automatic differentiation Jacobian with static arrays, you can see that you know the static arrays give, give us a big performance gain there, even despite using an automatic differentiated Jacobian. So while we, we uh, normally seek to write our ODEs in this state form, we can't always do that. Sometimes uh, we have this um, mass matrix form, so there's, there's terms on the right-hand side. And if we look at the Roberson equations, um, we can actually rewrite them like this. So the first two equations are identical and the third equation is a constraint equation. So this becomes now a set of differential algebraic equations, right? So we have two differential equations and an algebraic constraint. Um, you can get this constraint equation if you add up all three equations uh, to each other and then, and then integrate over time, uh, you'll, you can see, or, or if you take this equation and differentiate it with respect to time, you get the addition of all three equations. So you can verify that this constraint equation works. With this, now we have, uh, a, you know, it's the same set of equations, but we're gonna, we're modeling them as DAEs, uh, you know, for demonstration to show you how you'd solve these as long with, as well as, you know, using this mass matrix approach. So again, we're gonna define an in-place function and code up the equations as they look here. Uh, it's just our third equation now it doesn't really have a derivative term. Uh, you know, uh, so I'm moving this one to the right-hand side of the equation like that. Then I specify the mass matrix. In this case, the mass matrix is just one, one, zero, right? So that, that comes from the fact that there's just one derivative here, one derivative here, and there's no derivatives in the third equation. Right? So with that, I can set it up as an OD problem. Now passing in my mass matrix when I set up the OD function, and then go ahead and pass in the other arguments and solve. And I get, get that solution, same solution. So finally, uh, we're gonna talk about implicit DAEs. And this would be uh, you know, basically any set of ODEs that you can't, that are nonlinear, that you can't write in state variable form, you can model them as a DAE uh, in this type of way, right? So in this case, um, we're just re we just take those uh, DAE form of the Robertson equations and move everything to the right-hand side. Uh, so these are also called the residual form uh, of the equations. So in this case, I'm going to uh, write up, again, a, a, an in-place function where now this first argument out is the residual, right? So basically, the right-hand side of these equations are exactly as they look here, um, uh, and, and, and what's, what the, the in-place is just the, the out, the, the residual term uh, or, you know, the, the out of balance or part that should be ultimately equal to zero. Uh, so with this uh, set of equations, then uh, we can pass this into now, instead of an ODE problem, we pass it into a DAE problem. Uh, the, we pass the function in along with the initial conditions for both the derivatives and the states, time step and parameters. And then finally, this third or this last argument 
uh, which basically says which of the equations are have differential terms in them, right? So in the first case, in, in this case, the first two both have differential terms, and the second is just an algebraic constraint. We do have to pass in uh, initial condition for the uh, derivative terms, which all, don't always make mathematical sense to do this. And in the in the case when you when it doesn't make mathematical sense, you can just pass in all zeros and uh, they're not even used by the solver, but unfortunately, this is just a required argument. In the future, I think there's plans to remove that as a required argument. Once we have the DAE problem set up, we can pass that into the solver and plot, and of course, we get the same solution again. And so uh, we can also have a Jacobians here. In this case, uh, the Jacobian is defined for a DAE as, as gamma. Uh, times this term, so this is the, the derivative of the function with respect to the derivative of the state, um, and, and then this is your normal Jacobian term. So the function signature for the Jacobian here has this extra parameter gamma. Again, that's passed in by the solver, so basically then uh, I'm just hand coding this one up in place here, uh, and that's where the gamma terms come from there, but otherwise uh, it's pretty easy to follow. It's just the derivatives uh, as you compute them here. And uh, this is the result, which then we can pass in again to our DAE function. We pass in the Jacobian and set up the problem with the initial conditions, uh, time span parameters, differential variables, and then solve it. And again, we get the same solution. So finally, uh, the automatic differentiation version of these implicit DAEs, we can do that the same way. So in this case, um, I'm going to go ahead and use the static array approach. Uh, so this is not an in-place function, um, but uh, it, instead it returns a value, this, this static array. And then with that, I'm going to use automatic differentiation to compute the gradients again. Uh, in this case, in place, so the, the Jacobian is being passed in and I'm filling it in place. Uh, taking first the derivative with respect to du, uh, then multiplying by gamma, and then taking the derivative with respect to u and adding that to the Jacobian as it exists. And again, this is done in place and nothing is passed out of this function. So with those in hand, specifying the initial conditions as static arrays, passing in the function, the Jacobian, and the Jacobian prototype as a static array, and then passing all of that to DAE problem and solving, uh, we get this solution again. Uh, the final thing is just to benchmark all of those for the implicit DAE problems. Uh, you know, the, the first one is uh, the standard way with no Jacobian. The second way is with a hand written Jacobian. And the third way is with static arrays and an automatic differentiated Jacobian. And you see that we can, despite using, uh, uh, despite having to use uh, automatic differentiation to compute the Jacobian, the static arrays still gives us a performance increase over the other two. Uh, but it, notice all of these are slower than if we would have just solved them in the state variable form like we did at the beginning. So hopefully this gives you some ideas about how to solve differential equations in Julia, and uh, you can look at the documentation for differential equations JL for more information.